I'll let him introduce himself and take yeah, it away. There we go. I love it when grassroots, grassroots groups have conferences in big fancy hotels. <laughs> <laughs> Paradox is just, just a scream. So, uh, wow, this is pretty funny. Feels a little revolutionary, though, packed into these three rooms like this. Um, so, uh, I, I'm, where's Nick? I'm Nick. Here, here, here. This was your idea. So, your fault. I, you know, I've prepared nothing. I, in fact, I, I, for 40 years, I've taught children of pretty much every age, children, young people, I should say, and right up through college, and as young as two. And, and I can't remember a day where I ever prepared anything. So, it's just not the way I teach. The way I teach kids is we sit down together and I follow their lead. Everything we do is rooted in you know, their needs, their interests. Right. I'm just along for the ride. So, so I have no idea why the hell you all are here. And, <laughs> you know, who I am is you know, what I've done. I guess the reason you would... Why did you ask me to come? <laughs> what, do you, what do you want what to hear about? Doing here? Well, I'm interested in learning about more about democratic schooling and how it works and how the Albany Free School works. Okay. That's, that was my interest. So I, okay. yeah. We'll find out everybody else. So, so, but just so you know, so, so I don't teach at the school anymore, but for 35 years I taught there every day. I became the director eventually of this little inner city free school in Albany, New York. Okay. And, uh, It's a long story, you know, and then uh, uh, just another dimension, so you know, and another interesting dimension of the school is that, a very important dimension of the school is that, well, it's really two things. The, the, the school itself, partly by design, by our founder's design, and partly by, uh, I don't know, just organic evolution. The, the, the school itself is very much a community. In fact, it's more of a community than a school. We just call it a school because I think, especially the inner city parents, tr trusted that word. That word made sense to them. And what we were doing was already so bizarre that whatever we could do to, to seem normal and put parents at ease was a good thing to do. So we called it a school, but, but really not so much a school. And then the, the Around the school, again, well this is even more organically, but around the school, a, a community grew. You know, a real intentional, uh, whatever, community consisting of about, at that, I'd say at the heyday, at the height of everything, you know, probably 25 families and then other individual people considered themselves you know, members of this somewhat unusual, not not very structured, intentional community. So that's where I where I come from. I've also written books about all sorts of things, but I also help people around the world start schools, alternative schools. But but I, yeah, what do you guys? What what's the best I can tell you about the school? Yes. How did the state of New York allow this school to exist? Was they, it a private school. Yeah, we're private, we're private, totally private school. I mean, in the sense that we don't accept, we don't get any public funding. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, but the, the, the private, see, education laws are different state by state. I, you know, very paradoxically, in New York State, because they regulate the hell out of everything else, um, the private education law is, is extremely, it was written probably intentionally, to be very, very vague. So, what, what the law, actually, the only thing that the law specifies, you know, as far as, um, you know, the standard it sets for, for non-public schools, is that, uh, you know, a non-public school has to maintain a curriculum that's equivalent to the public schools. It's one sentence. It, it doesn't do anything to define what equivalent means. It's just one lovely sentence that you can drive a freight train. So we're, I mean, the way it's panned out, and what's this very, you know, it's just lovely, is that homeschoolers these days in New York State are way more regulated than we, you know, than we are. You know, they have to do standardized tests, they have to, you know, they have to prove they have a curriculum, and we have to do anything. I don't, I quit giving standardized tests years ago when I realized how abusive they were. 
meaningless they were, etc. So no, just, just just the luck of the draw, you know, liberal law. Yeah. Yeah. You said that uh, it was an intentional community. What were the intentions of the community? Like, what were the goals or priorities? Mm -hmm. or? That's a good question. You know, I guess it's kind of a weird answer, but but I, I think foremost the intention of the community was was to, to be a community. You know, to be a, a group of people that you know really trusted each other, that, that had a commitment to the community, that. You know, we're honest with each other. A lot of that sort of ephemeral stuff was the, I'd say, the, you know, the baseline. Um, but at the same time, the, the, the school grew up, the community grew up around the school. So the, the school had somewhat of a central, not everybody was involved in the school, but the school sort of always had a bit of a central, you know, that was one of the, sort of the common central tasks that, that kind of tied everybody together. Right, because I think communities, you always have to have, there has to be something that, I think, you know, even more than just an idea. You have to do something, you know, you got to do something together. So many of us were involved with the school in one fashion or another. Um, and then, I don't know, you know, I mean, we, so, as you, you know, the school was very important, but social justice and, and environmental justice was very important to a lot of us in the community. So we we're, were, we were very, we're in the inner city, so we were, I think it's important to say we were not walled off from the, you know, the neighborhood, the school, and the community were kind of set in. We were most many of us were really involved in the neighborhood and in city politics, and you know, a lot of we weren't, a, you know, we weren't separate in any way, like a an old '60s country commune or something. You know, we're, so a lot of us, a lot of us were activists of one stripe, you know, one kind or another. Um, for a while, we published a national magazine that just felt important. Then it was like, well, we should we should get the word out about whatever. So we, we had this thing we called the Family Life Journal, <coughs> Journal of Family Living. It finally became a pretty pretty popular, pretty cool national magazine. But we, we couldn't like all magazines. It finally we just couldn't keep it going financially. Could you discuss just the Sudbury concept in general? Is, is it the case he's, he mentioned that this is a Sudbury school? No, no. We're, we're not. We're similar, similar. but different. I was going to ask that too about how sort of you, you guys would differentiate. Because I, I wasn't saying you guys were the same. I was just saying you guys are similar to the Sudbury Valley School in Framingham. You know, and at least in some ways. Well, here, I mean, you know, vis-a-vis -vis every other kind of school in the country, you know, Sudbury schools and what you might call just free schools that, that don't have... You understand that there's a lot of Sudbury schools. That, that, uh, that an original one started just south of here in Framing, and uh, just outside of Boston. But then they sort of franchised themselves, right? And there's uh, 40 of them or something around the world now. Whereas you, you have probably an equal number of free schools, schools that would call themselves free schools, that are you know, similar no. principles. But they're all different. We don't have any kind of common, you know, every free school's got its own little idiosyncrasies and nuances. Uh, what exactly does free mean in that context? Yeah, free means that the children have a tremendous amount of uh, personal freedom. Cool. They, they, they're in charge, you know, as far as what they learn when, whether they go to a class or don't go to a class. Or, you know, what, their, their day is, is in their hands. Even kids in my school, kids as young as two. We, we had two-year-olds when I was there. It's awesome. Uh, all the time. I, uh, I was debating this with a friend last night, just, we were talking about um, just how, whether you need to, I don't know, coax a kid into uh, getting the foundations for reading, writing, and arithmetic, and then their interests take them where they go, or whether you let them, whether you go with complete freedom, and whether, how that, if that can ever backfire in terms of them not because there might be critical stages of learning for learning how to read or express yourself in writing or doing, you know, be able to do everyday math or balance a checkbook, right? Um, yeah. and I, I mean, that's, the, that's, that's the age-old question. That's probably the most frequently asked question. Because um, the second being, you know, what happens when they leave, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Because because we were, I was reading some stories. Um, we were talking actually, um, and there was a scenario where there was. Uh, some children that did not start even having showing an interest in basic math 
or reading until they were like 13 or 14 years old. And then over a period of a few years, they, they made rapid progress and they got themselves up to speed. But that's sort of a panicky scenario I can understand for parents where it's like your kid's 13 right. and can't read, like what's going on right. here? Yeah, no, that's a good question. You know, there's a few things to say. Maybe, I, I think it's important to separate reading out mm -hmm. from anything other, anything else we consider, you know, academic or basic skills, because it's so important, it's so, you know, so fundamental to everything else. It's what parents worry about the most, again, you know, for good reason. So what I can say about reading is that in my 40 years as a teacher, I have never met a child that didn't want to learn how to read. Generally, at a fairly young age. I mean, I've never met one. I've heard of other kids that, mm -hmm. through the homeschooling circles and so on. That, you know, oh, so and so, Johnny. Or I have a friend. Now I have a friend who, who ended up you know, with two PhDs in his own department at the State University of New York in Albany, a little older than me. But he went to this really cool free school called the Modern School. Anybody heard? That's a whole other yeah. story. But they were really, that was a whole cool movement that, that started in the late 1800s and carried on into the 20th century a little ways. So, so John, that their school was out. They didn't even have a schoolhouse. They just, they, it was kind of a commune they had outside of New York City. And so John just spent all his time outside because he loved to do. That's why he ended up with his own atmospheric sciences department at State University. <laughs> But he didn't want to learn to read till he was 10. He was just too damn busy. He was a wild kid that loved being outside, playing in the stream. And the commune was in the country. And there was the kind of thing where, in his case, when he turned, you know, when he was around 10, there was some like action serial, you know, in those days, they didn't have comic books, but there were like these action serials that would come out once a month, like comic books. And he just wanted to read the thing so damn bad. It was like, and he didn't want his mother to read it to him. He's like, I want to read this thing. So he says he, you know, he said to his mom, who was one of the teachers, you know, will you teach me to read? And, and he learned to read, you know, a, a month or something. He said, but the kids that I have all, always known, the, the 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 kids that didn't learn to read, pretty quickly, you know, when they were five, six, seven, or you know, younger than that. I've known plenty of kids who taught themselves to read by the time they were four or five. But the kids who didn't, who had a hard, the, the kids who didn't, you know, get right into reading. It was because it was they were having a hard time, right? They were a little dyslexic or you know whatever was going on. But, I mean, they they really reading is a bear. Reading is not easy for de depending on how your kind of brain you have and, and so on and so on. Reading can really be a bear, much much worse than any of the other subjects. So anyway, those kids would avoid reading maybe sometimes because it was just who wants to do something that's so damn frustrating and you don't feel like you're getting anywhere. Yeah, it's, that's not fun. So those kids then actually need, you know, they need some special teaching um, of one kind or another, you know, to kind of help them break the code. But but but, and then it's no big deal. And and it, as long as the kid is, as long as the child is, is going to stay, in, you know, was going to stay in our school and not move and end up in public school somewhere and, and not know how to read at the age of eight, and then get stuck in a special ed class because they couldn't read, even though they were perfectly, you know, their intelligence was perfectly fine, and that kind of thing. You know, our, our feeling was, and we would communicate this, this to the parents if they were worried, was that who cares if she, she or he doesn't learn to read until they're 10? I mean, really, why does it matter? Who cares? You know, you don't really know how to read fluently until you're in high school. Uh, you don't. You really don't. That's, that's when the clock starts ticking as far as getting into college. That's when you have to start accumulating credits. And colleges don't look at your seventh grade transcript. Harvard doesn't give a damn what you did in seventh grade. But they care what you did in ninth grade, some. And then, you know, as you get further into high school, your, your academic performance starts to count more. That's a long story, but, but, but I just want to finish. But I, I, can, I don't know how many kids in our school, you know, we're, we're artistic kids, imaginative kids, what I call right brain kids, who, who, who hated math. They weren't good at it. They weren't suited for, for math, you know, conceptually. It was, it was, again, it was hard for them. It didn't come easily. And I didn't care if that, you know, with the reading kids, we would say, we usually figure out, oh, well, God, he's a little dyslexic. That's, that's the problem. And then we'd just give him help. And they'd, they'd eagerly want the help. But with math, I, I wouldn't care. To, to be honest with you, and I, I don't know how many kids in my class, you know, seventh and eighth grade class, they would get to seventh grade or eighth grade, and then, but see, we stop after eighth grade, so then they would 
they had, to, they had to go on to Albany High or some, some other, you know, some high school after us. So they would, you know, they, but it would, they would do it. I wouldn't have to go, you know, you're going to be in ninth grade next year. You better start learning math. They would do it. They'd look over that little edge of eighth grade and go, oh, shit. I better start learning some math. <laughs> you know, I'm going to be in Albany High next year. And I don't want to look like an idiot. You know, whatever. And so that, that but that's, then you would see that in, in, you know, two months, three months, six months, easily by the end of the year, you know, their eighth grade year, they'd be fine. They'd be doing algebra, they'd be up to grade level, high school, no problem, no problem with transition. Yes? About what age would you um, intervene <coughs> if the child did display trouble in reading? Whenever they just started displaying the trouble or? Well, generally the sooner the better. But, but I, I just can remember a few kids where particularly boys that, that I think partly they were maybe a little dyslexic. Dyslexia is really hard to diagnose with some kids. Some kids it's really obvious, you know, the letters float off the page and, you know, all kinds of weird things happen. And that's obviously just like, but other kids, like, just really rambunctious, high-energy boys, sometimes it seemed to me partly they, they just had too much going on. And they, they, they would try to read, you know, they would, but they just, so you... You wouldn't push it, you know. They, the, the, you'd keep the little lessons short, you know, and, and, and their progress wouldn't be real great because they. But, but then just it seemed to be with some of those kids, there would just be this organic thing. Was as they got older, as long as the rest of their life was in in order, you know, we should talk about. I mean, there's, there's a lot of times kids have trouble learning also because, you know, their emotional selves are a train wreck, or their their lives away from school are a train wreck, and they're traumatized, or you know, whatever in chaos, you know, that can make learning very difficult too, so we would always work with that, but, but anyway, with these boys, as they calmed down, just, just by getting older sometimes, that would make the difference. Once they really could sit still for 45 minutes or an hour and focus, because that reading takes so much, that linear, you know, anyway, does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Can I ask you, you said that they would start getting anxious about going to the high school, so they would basically go from your school to a regular public school, yeah. high school? The majority of them. If they had money, they might be able to go to a private school or um, public what, school or something. What other kind of anxieties did they have, you know, in regards to, you know, kind of assimilating into the government school? Uh, um, for some kids, the, the size of it, Albany High has like 2,800 students. So that's for, you know, a shy, I mean, we didn't have too many kids graduate from our school that were shy and more timid, but, but still, they might be a little bit so. So maybe a little odd by the size. Was there any kind of um, perceptions of some kids coming from your school into those schools? Like by the people already the in the people public? In the public yeah, schools, good, did good, they good have question. some sort of stigma attached to them as they went in? Or? No, it, it, it may be in the very beginning. I don't remember back that far. But I, I remember getting some calls from guidance counselors like, I don't know what to do with this kid, you know, because we didn't send a transcript, because there was no transcript, you know, we didn't know great. We, anyway, no, but pretty quickly it was the opposite, because they got to see, you know, how mature our kids were, how, how responsible they were. They loved learning. You know, they engaged with the teachers, they formed, you know, they, they weren't afraid of adults, they, they, they formed real relationships with their teachers. Uh, you know, they were just sort of good citizens, they were into it, so they, no, they loved free school kids. It was like, oh boy, but we had a reputation for producing these really, and the teachers, they couldn't understand, it's like, why are these kids, how can these kids be so, you know, does that make sense? It really became the case, yeah. That seems hard for me to, to grasp, just because you're going from this uh, scenario where the children are creating their own structure to a large degree into a pretty regimented structure, and uh, there wasn't rebellion or sort of just like tension where like the teachers are like, you have to do this now, and that's like the first time the kids like ever no, heard that. It's, it's the opposite. It, it's the other kids that are doing the rebel rebelling at that point. The kids that have been chained to their desks for 14 years, well, 10 years already. Right. Those are the ones that are rebelling. Now our kids, it was just, I mean, they didn't like it. You know, I remember how bored my daughters were. 
And I, I had some, I, I encouraged both my daughters to homeschool, actually, and then take community college courses with, you know, take courses they were really interested in. But they're stubborn, you know, they're going to do what they wanted to do. And they really wanted to be like other kids. They wanted to be normal. They were tired of living in this little weird, you know, sort of countercultural bubble, etc. But they'd be so bored. I guess they'd come home after school and you know, they just, just dead. <laughs> oh, my, my, Older daughter did almost drop out after sophomore year. I mean, she just couldn't take it anymore. The boredom was just so. The courses were just such bullshit. You know, ninety percent of it was. You know, half of her teachers were burnout and kind of a little bit sadistic sometimes in terms of you know just almost enjoying making it hard for the kids and and so on. And just the whole power thing. So Lily almost dropped out, but she's stubborn and, and she she stayed. She ended up by the end of the summer she decided to go back. She wanted to. Were there no alternatives other than? No, there is now. We finally started one, but blind, but no, there weren't really. No, no alternatives. And does the state uh, regulate grades nine and not more than below, or? Yeah, okay. yeah. If you want to get in New York State, there's there's two kinds. There right now there are two kinds, two kinds of high school diplomas. There's something called a school diploma, which is kind of you know low rate, and then. The, the more college prep kind of, you know, college track <coughs> diploma is called a Regents Diploma. And to get the Regents Diploma at any school, public or doesn't matter, then you have to pass the Regents exams, you know, in each, in each course, for one thing. And, and, and then you have to just, then the whole Carnegie credit system kicks in. You know, just like college, you can't get a Regents Diploma unless you've got four math credits. You know, three language. You know what I'm saying? Just like college. So, so our, our the, the Democratic high school that we started that grew out of our school that quit at the end of eighth grade. Um, yeah, the, the kids had to get those credits. They had no choice about that. But then, of course, how we went, how how we go about them getting. You know, the classes take on a lot of the children's the students' interests. They're really informal sometimes. Um, you, you know, the, the, the history class will be just way more interesting and way more relevant. You know, the state doesn't dictate curriculum, they just, still, they just di dictate that the kid has to, you have to certify that they did four years of, of math mm -hmm. and two years of history, right? The, the school has, they don't come and look over each other, the school has a lot of leeway, but at the same time, it's, the, the, it's more mandatory. I mean, that it, it, it Harry Tubman, you know, if you don't go to, you know, 80% of your math classes over the course of the year, you don't get your math credit. So, did you say that there's some sort of Carnegie credential system in place in at the high school? Yeah. At the high school level? Yeah, just like any other high school. Yeah. Is that that's nationwide? No, New York State. I say that's every state has different they have their own state education laws. So, so I know the Sudbury Valley School, at least more recently, has been sort of monitoring or at least following up with students who uh, passed through their school mm -hmm. and now have gone on to college. And I, I don't know if they've done any studies, like any statistical work on it, but like, does Albany do that at all? Do they? Do you guys ever follow up with your students and well, see? Sudbury Valley has money. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Of, they have a lot of money. That's true. So, no, we have never had time or okay. the wherewithal to do it. Yeah, that's true. But it's great that Sudbury has, because and I've read those studies. That's, this is the Massachusetts school that's all over the place. They, they actually hired a firm that does that kind of survey work. So they sort of hired an independent entity to do the survey. And, and they're a bigger school. They're 200 and some students. So, and they're, they, go, they date back to the very early 70s. So they have you know, a lot of, anyway, so I think they followed up on I don't know, hundreds and hundreds, maybe a thousand even. Graduate. So it's a big, you know, it's a pretty broad statistical survey. Yeah. yeah. It's good, that, and it just shows shows a lot of things. But I think the coolest thing that it shows, because I, I don't think the socioeconomic indicators are too relevant, because the Sudbury is pretty much middle and upper middle class. It's almost entirely middle and upper middle class yeah. kids. They, they have no. They actually don't allow student aid. That's right. one thing I don't agree with. Yeah, them sure. About, but <coughs> they're intentionally a school for privileged children, but. Whatever, you know, I, but I always say privileged children have a right to be happy too and have a right to go to, to good schools, so what the hell. But the thing that it shows overall, this, the survey of all, after they, is, is that like 
100% of the graduates of Sudbury Valley, who are now adults, all said the same thing about their lives, which was kind of like, I'm paraphrasing, but it was kind of like, well, you know, my life's not perfect, but I am living exactly the life that I want to be living. It makes sense to me. You know, I feel good about it. Uh, you know, it's mine. <laughs> and, and interesting, and I think the employment thing was interesting, that, that not a whole lot of the graduates of Sudbury Valley went into, you know, canned jobs. A, 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 an, an inordinate number of them created their own ways to make make their livings in the adult world. So it's like kind of encouraged entrepreneurship, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. I mean, if yes. If you've always been in charge, you know, why would you suddenly want to just go and sit at a desk and, you know, when you when you haven't been in this pyramidal, you know, when your school was the place where the, the power was completely shared across the whole thing, then why would you want to go into a career where, you know, I, I can just... I, I'm actually, um, I live in Worcester, so I'm right near Sudbury Valley, and so yeah. I'm actually trying to be, um, see if I can become sort of like a, um, I forget what they call them, uh, I forget what the technical term, the staff member, I guess. Um, so I'm actually trying to aim for that. So in, in the process, I've read a few books about the school, and it's always way more interesting to me that to read about sort of the schools, the, the, the people's experiences uh, for, from when they used to uh, go at the school, then read sort of the theoretical, philosophical stuff from um, uh, Hannah Greenberg and um, I think Daniel Greenberg, I think mm -hmm. the other. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's always more interesting to me to, to read students' sort of past experiences and how it helped them in their life than yeah. read the sort of abstract. Yeah, I mean, that's I interesting to me too, but. You know, but it doesn't mean much. It doesn't mean much if it doesn't actually work out. Yeah. You know. Well, if, uh, what I always say, and, this, and I practice this myself, sure. if, if you want to know what. You know, if you just want to go check a school out as a parent, any you, know, you as an adult want to go check a school out, or it would be the same for a kid, I guess. But and you, you, you talk to the kids. You know, don't waste. I mean, go ahead. You know, talk to other people. But if you really want to know, yeah, talk to the kids and ask them, how do you like school? <laughs> how does your school work? Right? They're going to tell you. The adults may or may not tell you. I tried to be honest, but. But the adults can also just start blah blah blah. Well, you know, this is the this is the ideology of the school, and this is this, and this it's democratic, and oh, the children have freedom, and blah 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 blah. Right. Right. So, um, so what would you recommend for? I mean, do you have any sort of tips or, or advice or ideas about sort of people who want to get involved with uh, these sort of schools, like become members of them? I'm I'm personally interested in that, but you know, maybe other people would be interested in getting more involved in these sort of places. Um, you know, like in regards to credentials that are required? Or oh, yeah, just sort of like, yeah, just sort of like ideas about how to get involved, like what, how much, how much, how much credentials should you have, or should, do you need any, or, you know, that kind of stuff. Because I mean, I don't have, personally, I don't have any teaching credentials, you know. Yeah, but, I don't, I don't okay. <laughs> and you're the director, so. I don't have a college degree, so. Okay, so fair there. enough. Yeah, I don't um, either. But, uh, well, anyway, well, maybe but again, as far as credentials go, again, it's a state thing. Yeah. It's really liberal in New York State, the requirement for credential teachers. Is, I think it's something is specified, but it's like the school has to have one credential teacher for, I don't know, 100 students or something. It's a very minimal requirement. And, and they never checked up. I, I actually, I, I'm not sure we always met that requirement at, at my school. <laughs> but no one checked. Yeah. The state didn't initially. They did visit us a few times just to see if the kids were learning to read and that sort of thing. And they just stopped coming. They only came, I think, the first three years the school was in. You know, somebody from the school district came the first two or three years to check on this equivalent, equivalent curriculum requirement. And yeah. that, we never saw them again. <laughs> but, it, but it might be different in Massachusetts. You yeah. should check. I, I yeah. don't know. I, I really don't know. Well, and it's not just the state mandates. I mean, there's going to be the individual schools are going to have their own preferences as well. Like for instance, well, well, that's true too. Cause, cause but but the states, some states do have yeah. mandates, though. It yeah. may be true. In some states, it might be you have to have a teacher certification, even in a private school. I don't know. You have to check. You have to check it out. Yeah. Okay. I mean, New Hampshire's pretty. I don't know if anyone's interested in New Hampshire, but I think they're pretty strict here. You have to have teacher <coughs> credentials just to work in an after-school program. Really? What I? Yeah. I mean, oh, right now, I think. I mean, I'm a director of an after-school program, and shouldn't be. 
<laughs> to be <laughs> honest, but they're so desperate. So my master's degree, in it, which is not in teaching, but is in counseling, yeah. plus the three years I've had as an after-school counselor in New York City, kind of combined, is good enough. Good enough. Um, and I, but like, like I say, I'm not even sure if it really is, but they're allowing it because they really want me to be in the role, you know, and mm -hmm. so, but New Hampshire's pretty strict on okay. some of those credentials. I know they are. Yeah, it's unfortunate. It is. But in terms of actual preparation, <coughs> I think that's a really important issue. Um, I think a, a thing that happens is for a lot of people anyway, a lot of adults, a, a lot of adults who like me and probably most of us here went to conventional schools throughout our childhood and you know, may or maybe didn't like it, whatever, but still, especially if, if at some point beyond that, you know, we stop and we look back over our education and we go, wait a minute, yeah, that, that didn't make any sense, that was crazy, or whatever, you know, whatever. and then or maybe you had a bad time anyway. But in my case, I, I had, oh, school was easy for me. I was lucky. I went to public school, but I had a good memory. I was smart. I knew how to play the game. So it was a breeze. I, I didn't mind that part of it. I, I hated the boredom part, or whatever. You know, it was a troublemaker to deal with that. You know, you know, make things interesting. But, um, but anyway, so let's say you had a bad time, or you just whatever. And then you hear about these free schools. And you hear about these schools where you know, you, kids don't have to go to class if they don't want to. And they, they just learn what they want to learn. And there's no time pressure. And there's no grade. And you hear about that as an adult, right? And you go, wow, that's amazing. Wow, that's cool. I, I wish I could have gone to a school like that. Or, 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 you get, or I want to get involved. That's where I want to teach, right? You just really get caught up in it. And it's very can be very seductive, really seductive, and, and that's what draws you. So then you go and you, you either start a school like that yourself, because there are people starting schools. It's a pretty big little revolution going on again, like there was not as much, not as big a revolution as in the '60s and '70s, but, but anyway. Or you go and find a school. It's like you go right. and you teach there, right? It it can be a, a it, you know it. it can be a rough transition if, if, if what your experience is 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 in a school where you know the, especially you know where the teacher is always in control like right, controlling all of the action right and has a whole bunch of rules and regulations in this this other structure to, to back them up all the time to, to maintain order and so on so that's that, if that's all you know um, and suddenly you're in this completely different environment, as you can imagine, where you're not in control. You know, everybody's, everybody's equal, really. And, and there isn't so much structure. There's a lot more improv, improv, improvisation going on. And uh, I, I've just seen many adults when they've come to our school, and it was true for me in the beginning. I, I thought it was crazy. I I'd actually, it's another story, but I actually didn't start teaching at the Albany Free School because of the philosophy of the school. I had a whole other agenda at that time. Um, so when I first set foot in the door of the place, I, I just thought it was insane. It was just completely like, and I, I was a little freaked out. I was only 19, but I don't think the age had to do it. I was just like, whoa. It might have been an advantage that I was only 19. But I've seen a lot of pr prospective teachers come to our school, maybe after they finished college. Um, and, and so on, so they're already, and they're just lost, they're lost, and, and they actually don't, they, they don't have the skills, they're not even close to having the skills that they need to, to be effective teachers in this totally different kind of environment, and sometimes, and sometimes it works out okay, like I figured it out, but I've seen plenty of adults, they, they never figure it out, they just, they almost, they almost get tighter, because they're like, oh my god, the kids are, Whatever in it, it doesn't go well, or, or they or they go in the opposite direction. These young and, and, and they just become really, they, they just like throw all the you know caution to the wind. They they just want the kids to like them and they want to be nice and they want to be fun and friendly and those those kinds of teachers in, in my case would, would just drive me crazy. 
because they were terrible with the kids. They were just letting the kids walk all over them and really giving the kids the message, oh, you can just do whatever you want. And you don't have to respect each other, and you don't have to respect the building, and, and so on. So it's a good question. I think, I so think my, my advice is yeah. visit, you know, spend time in, these, in a school somewhere. Just spend some time and stop reading about it and actually physically be in that setting so that you get a feel for the reality of it and not just the great ideas yeah. and all the seductive stuff. Sudbury, Sudbury is actually, um, I, I guess, to apply to their school or whatever, you have to buy some of their books or something like that. I don't know if you know this, but... No, you, I know. I know yeah, Ulster. Yeah. I know Dan. I, I know the founders very yeah. well. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, so I'm only reading about it so much because yeah, you have to to apply. So I just, I do find I just it don't think, I don't think the reading is much preparation. Sure, to be yeah, honest with that's you. fair. Yeah. Um, I think we're about out of time. If anyone has any real dire questions, we can ask him. What... I just want to ask a quick sure. question. Um, is there a situation, you're saying that the children can, they didn't want to go to class, they could do what? Is there is there supervision? What kind of, like, what would else would they do? Is it get really chaotic and annoying to other students? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Good question. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, that's not what we want, but, but, but I mean, they really can do whatever they want. Do they always have to be supervised? No, there's there's a lot of non-supervision. Okay. I, I don't believe it's true. But 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 you well, can I just see, mean, like, you can see the problem. Hand. But but then, but the way it works in reality yeah. is that kids kids who are especially the kids that came to our preschool when they started when they were two or three yeah. okay. and became immediately familiar with this, yeah. you know, for being in charge of themselves, right, 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 and not being told what to do all the time, right, or or, or just kids in general, kids who are happy. Kids whose homes were, were pretty chill, they, their emotional needs were pretty well being met, their parents weren't constantly telling them what to do and being really authoritarian, and so on. Those kids, just, that's natural be, to that's them. That's what they want. I mean, that's yeah. fine. But of course, we're, we're constantly getting kids that are getting kicked out of public school. You know, there's nowhere else. So, and we don't charge, you know, we, we let kids come for whatever they can pay. So we're constantly getting kids who are, you know, half out of their minds, and they're angry, and their lives are a mess. So you can imagine giving them this kind of freedom and very little supervision. It can, yeah, it, it's a dance. It's, it's, it's tricky. And, and sure, in the beginning, that's what they do. They raise yeah. hell, they break yeah. every rule they can, and the teachers, we just have to kind of, oh, you know, and bear with it, and, and you know, you know, and it, you know on a, most of the time, it you know it, it works out. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't. Some kids just can't yeah. ever. Yeah. They they just they more fortunately story. they need to be super. You know they can't yeah. handle the freedom. It's not fair to the other kids. They do they, they cause too much chaos. And then I would have to say to the parents, you know nothing. It's not that your kid. It's just that this isn't the place. Right. You know he actually does need more. Whatever that we can't give him. All right. Well, I think Thank that's you. gonna that's gonna do it. Thank you. All right.